Hey everyone, this has been a pretty decent week, so you're not going to hear me crying at the front of the podcast. Uh, For those of you who have been listening the whole time, you definitely noticed a change in tone the last two weeks, at least with my intros, but this week we're just back to normal. I got really great feedback on the last two, actually, just people enjoying open conversations and also people really enjoying Mariana, so I'm going to be on her podcast soon, I'll be posting about that, but... This week, we have another artist. So this is, I don't know, it's just so fun for me to talk to artists because, as I've said before, I just really respect what they do. I respect what a lot of people do, but artists just kind of have my heart. So this one will be an absolute joy to listen to. At least it was for me, listening back when I was doing all the editing. I have mentioned before, but I do all my own editing, and I really love that process. And it's something that takes a lot of time, but it's really fun. This week, I also actually recorded a new intro and outro. The script is almost the same. I stuck with that, but I have a new mic. I use a Rode Podcaster now. The first mic I had didn't handle the way I talk with my arms and just my movement very well. I often record certain things standing up, and I do all my comedy standing up, and I move around a bit. So this one handles it well. I'm happy with how the intro and outro sound now. I wasn't before. It sounded like I was in a cave One of my friends who listens called it creepy. Um, I don't know if it was creepy, but it was definitely just a little bit different (laughs) sounding. So anyway, that's what's going on there. But uh, listening to this guest, Stuart, talk about his journey through just kind of getting to where he is now and just how grounded he is about the whole path is great. I think what I hope people get out of this one is just that something Stuart said, I mean, just if, you know, you're on a path, it may not seem like it's going to lead to where you want. It probably will. And one of my favorite books is The Alchemist, and it's about a journey. And I really like just the idea that when we sometimes look back at our lives and what's happened and, you know, it could be past relationships. Like I know almost everyone's had their heart broken at some point thinking that they lost the one, but they really didn't. You know, that one probably would have limited you somehow or they worked a job that was horrible and they wish they hadn't and maybe if they'd done another path and whatever all of us have that I have that for sure I have that even some days now but then I look at what I'm doing and just how okay but I'm moving forward I'm I'm working towards the next thing and so it's again to the idea for me right now that I'm getting into is it's not too late you can just try it try what it is you want to do so this one we're talking to Stuart Stevens he's a muralist which is harder to say than you would think and an artist and I met him in Dallas when I worked with his wife actually it was just super fun to talk to him you you will hear us uh refer to Clubhouse so Clubhouse is an app some people may have heard of some may have not it's an audio app if you want more than work has a club on there Basically, you just go on and listen to people talk, and you can also participate and talk. And so I'm recording a few podcasts on Clubhouse, trying that out. If you want to participate, just follow the podcast on social media. I post about it all the time. Message me on one of the many ways you can message me, and I can help you with getting an account because I have some referrals I can do. It's on iOS only right now, but we'll be on Android soon. So anyway, we're referring to Clubhouse a few times. I'm recording a podcast on clubhouse this week now of course you might not be listening to this the week it comes out but it's likely i'll still be around there checking that out i'm checking out another app called stereo and there's a lot going on with audio so that's pretty cool we just finished the oscars this was a big oscars week elton john had his oscar party online that was so fun i've held an oscar party for like 20 years and it's been a hard couple of last couple of years from that perspective for me, just because I really like doing that. It's a lot of fun for me, but it was so cool to see Dua Lipa or Dua Lipa. I don't even know how to say her name, to be honest. Elton John says it one way. I say it another way. And um, I don't know. I'm not going to say Elton John's wrong about something, though. But she was on there. Neil Patrick Harris, David Furnish. It was just great. It was it was so fun. Cynthia Revo. I had a great time watching that. And then I stayed up all night and a friend from the States was online. and I was chatting with my mom and just... You know, had a good time watching Nomad Land. One, I recommend this movie to anyone. I was very doubtful about it. I had heard some mixed reviews by different people, and I was like a doubter. 
And about 40 minutes in, I was like, I don't know how I feel about this movie. By the end, I, of course, I was in tears. And I absolutely loved it. It's, again, just about kind of, well, for me, I think it was about grief and holding on to something. But in general, I think this theme of this week can just be about, like, go where your path is leading you. That's just the message I want to leave you with. So we're going to get into it. You're going to hear an intro. And then I'm going to talk to Stuart and just have fun with this one. Have a great time. He's a great guy. There's information on how to follow him on social media later. And thanks. Thanks for being here. Thanks for giving me your time. And I look forward to hearing what you think. Please start responding to me on social media. I really want to hear what people think of the pod. Welcome to More Than Work, the podcast reminding you that your self-worth is defined by more than your job title. I'm Rabia, an IT project manager, comedian, nonprofit volunteer, and sometimes activist. Every week, I'll chat with a guest about pursuing passions outside of work or creating meaningful opportunities inside the workplace. As you listen, I hope you'll be inspired to do the same. Here we go. All right. Welcome back this week, everyone. I'm really excited to have this guest on. We actually met a long time ago when we both lived in Dallas, and now I'm in London and he's in Basel, and we're chatting here about the career he's transitioned into. So it's artist and custom muralist Stuart Stevens. Mess up your name right away. That's awesome. (laughs) How's it going, Stuart? (laughs) (laughs) It's going fantastic. It's going fantastic. Good. So you just want to introduce yourself a little bit to the More Than Work audience? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for having me on the show. I'm Stuart Stevens. I'm an artist and uh, custom muralist here in Basel, Switzerland. So yeah, so excited to be here and looking forward to it. Yeah. So how long? So we're both expats. We're both American, just so everyone everyone knows <laughs> just, they're hearing us. Just in case anybody could tell with our accents, yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, some people think I'm Canadian every once in a while, and I'm like, sure. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> you know? What's that all about? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's usually about my style of dress, which is like flannels and stuff like that, you know? So, But yeah, so when did you move over to Switzerland? Uh, I moved over to Switzerland about two and a half years ago. We came over for actually my wife's work. So she was based in, in we were based in Dallas, and then we had the opportunity to come over to switzerland which is kind of a no-brainer so we jumped at the chance right away and haven't looked back and it's been just unbelievably amazing being over here it's been really 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 cool yeah no that's great and it's really it is cool to live abroad or just to live in different cities i mean i went from california to new york one time and i stayed there for about five years but it was a huge it was a huge cultural like shift for me and a culture shock just going from somewhere i always drove to somewhere I was always in the subway, for example. Absolutely. Is, yeah, you know, so is there anything that kind of hit you when you moved over there? Well, I think, oh, first of all, that's super cool that you got both West Coast, East Coast, and a little bit yeah. of Dallas in the Central. <laughs> that's kind of awesome. Yeah. You, you pretty much, I feel, touched all the bases in the U.S. <laughs> yeah, moving here, I think, was a big adjustment because Dallas, as you know, is, is probably a bit more like California, L.A., where you're driving a lot. And here in Basel you don't really drive at all i mean there's no Mm -hmm. no real reason to that kind of blew me away when i first got here when the public transit was down to a minute like -hmm. they are so efficient it's sometimes it's annoying how efficient the swiss are because it's like how can you guys be this good at this you know right you know it's just kind of annoying sometimes it's like why how, how are the streets all so clean all the time why do your transits like run on time it's just you know, it's a, that get, kind of annoying at times, but it's also amazing. So that was a big adjustment, moving from a driving culture in Dallas mm-hmm. to a completely public transit culture here. Yeah, that's a lot different. And that's interesting about the on-time things. I think, you know, I'm in London, so the tube, well, I mean, I haven't been on the tube much in the last year, let's put it that right. way. <laughs> but yeah, before right. that, like, it runs. I mean, you know when it's going to come, but it's not necessarily like, on time in the sense that you're saying i don't think and then in new york it's like man i can wait 45 minutes just for the train to get home you're scheduling it with a calendar on what day it might show up you know (laughs) yeah yeah it's crazy so that's good it's like so efficient there though that's pretty nice 
Yeah, you know, it's funny. When I first got to Switzerland, this is probably a great example of the Swiss culture and being on time. I was in a group chat, and one of our friends texted, and he's a Swiss guy, and he was like, hey, guys, I am so, so sorry. Super spur of the moment. <laughs> Do you guys have any plans for next Thursday? And it was like Friday the week before. And I was thinking it was like, you know, super spur of the moment. Mm -hmm. you're, you're outside, you know, in the truck. Let's go right now. We're 30 minutes late already, you know, kind of spur yeah. of the moment. And he's like, hey, guys, super spur of the moment. What are you doing next Thursday? And I was like, oh, man, that's, that in a nutshell is a bit of the Swiss culture about how on time and planned they are when it comes to everything. So, wow, a little bit of adjustment. I guess that's why their trains <laughs> run on time. Yeah, that's that's great. That's funny. I mean, yeah, because we're our spur of the moment is all. Hey, are you doing anything? No, want to hang out? Grab yeah, like right now, you know, or like in yeah. a couple of hours or something. You know? Yeah, yeah. So I introduced you, and you, I think, introduced yourself too. Maybe you didn't on that part, but as an artist and custom muralist. But when I met you, and I'm really curious about how this transition happened for you. You were basically an audio engineer, as far as I remember. Like. At a, in Dallas, like at a church or something, and then at a theater, and you were doing all kinds of stuff when I met you. So what, how, first of all, were you in that field, and what's your background there? And then let's talk about how you got into the painting. Okay. Well, I got my master's in theater, actually, mm -hmm. which I got it from Louisiana Tech, and I want to do a big shout-out to, to Mark Gwynn. He's one of the professors there that's basically like my artist mentor, you know, my... Mm -hmm. my uh, Splinter, if you want a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles throwback. So he, he was a sculpture, sculpture, and he had moved into theater because he, he was a lighting designer. He started sculpting with light is how mm -hmm. he liked to describe it. And so he was a huge influence on me. He's the one that recruited me into the theater and was just a huge influence on my, my artistic side. I, of course, come from a very artistic family. My grandmother was a painter. My dad works in theater, you know, mm. playwrights, actors. My sister's an artist. And so across the board there, it's everywhere. But I went and got my master's in theater. And then from there, I went to Dallas because I got it in, in Louisiana. And when I got to Dallas, you kind of come to the conclusion really quick that you better learn how to do everything if you're going to survive, in, especially mm. in this business. And so I, I had a real love for music anyway, and so I kind of got pushed into being an audio engineer. And I remember my first job, I, because my master's was in performance and, yeah. well, pretty much everything, but I, I was an actor for, 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 for most of it. And I remember I was like, man, I don't need to know audio engineering. I just need to know how to act like a techie. And so that's, <laughs> that's what I knew how to do. So I got my first job, and it was horrible. I ruined shows, but they were very forgiving. I had guys that you know, took me under their arm and really lifted me up. I couldn't be anywhere. I wouldn't be anywhere without the guys in, in Dallas in the production. They helped me so much in so many different ways. And, but with that first job, I also had a job as a scenic designer. And I think that's really mm -hmm. when, when my art kind of started taking its shape. And through then, I started designing shows. And the one thing about doing theatrical design and scenic design is you're designing for different eras and different shows and different everything so every time you're you're having to draw something new and so it pushes you from a from an art side in that aspect that you're having to you know draft things render things and at the same time as that was going on and i was in dallas you know i fell in with a few artist reprobates that you know taught me more and more about art and that kind of got a bit into graffiti though mm -hmm. you know I can't, would never say that I did any graffiti in Dallas, just so... No, it's just you happen to know about it. If, if they ever, Exist. ever were listening or checking anything, absolutely not. And especially if my kids ever listen to this, absolutely not. That's a horrible, no. horrible thing. So I, I kind of fell in love with graffiti at the same time of doing scenic art. And uh, we started a company, a scenic design company, and that just kind of grew more and more. And we had our warehouse, which was amazing. And we, you know, bounced from job to job and paint and... And just kind of set me on my way. And I didn't, I guess I didn't really even realize that I was grooming myself to be an artist or being mm -hmm. groomed by, you know, fate, if it will, if you will. Because I was just, I was painting and drawing all the time, even though I wouldn't at that point consider myself much of an artist. But that was what I was having to do for my day job. And then I began to love it more and more. And that heavy influence from the graffiti side and the theater mm -hmm. side 
kind of shaped me to where I'm at. And when we had the opportunity to move over here, it was, it was really, I had no idea what I was going to do when I came over here. I was like, yeah, I'm kind of done with theater, you know, at the moment, you know, I'm looking for something new. And my wife was like, why don't you post some of the stuff that you're painting? And I was, you know, of course, my wife has all the good ideas and all the inspiration <laughs> and everything. So I can't take credit for anything. And I was like, no, nah, no. Nah. I was like, nobody wants to see what I want to paint. You know, classic, classic artist who is like, nobody loves me. And she was like, uh, no, you should po- you should really post this. And so I posted it in a couple of expat groups in different places on Facebook. And the post just they just exploded. And and I all of a sudden was in business. And then people wanted these and my work translated really, really easy because well, I would paint sets and, but now I wasn't painting sets. I was painting people's houses. So, mm-hmm. but due to the fact that probably somewhere in my past, I had to paint, you know, a 1940s style, whatever, I can pretty much paint whatever these clients need or want. And so it kind of, in a weird way, prepared me for now, for being in Switzerland because I had to work with so many different directors, so many different visions, so many different things. And so now that I'm in Switzerland and I do the custom murals for people, it's, you know, I really find I'm very happy making them happy, like getting the mm-hmm. vibe that they want and create because it's their home, their space. I, I will say in that it's probably Corona probably helped me out more than anybody else because it made mm-hmm. everybody work from home. And then they were looking at their walls and were like, oh, man, <laughs> if I got to be here, I got to put some art on the wall. So all that pretty much happened at the same time. And it just kind of skyrocketed. And, and then from there, I was pushed to do more of my own canvas work. And then, yeah, then it just kind of. Whoosh. And so that's kind of how I went from Dallas to where I'm at now, if that makes any sense. Yeah, no, it does. It's very cool. One thing I want to talk about really quick is like the street art, just because I have a real love for it really and i think there's definitely a difference between like tagging and actual street art and in a lot of cities i've gone to i've gone on tours to see it like my friends in bristol will just take me around to new pieces they found which is awesome so i visited them twice in the last like few years and um here in london i actually did a street art tour where we got to do our own art with the spray can and yeah and i was really actually i don't know if i was super bad like really bad at it i mean i did like really simple stuff and then Glasgow, same thing. And one thing they were doing up there was having, like, walls that were kind of dedicated to it. Like, they knew people were going to do it and practice and stuff. And they're not going to be, like, a top artist right away. But they just have – I'm pretty sure it was there where they just had kind of a safe space for people to do that. And it was interesting to me. And I don't know. I think it really can add a lot of color to a city. I mean, I know it can also be kind of ugly in some places, certain styles, but how do you feel about it? I mean, having met people who do that. Well, I think, I mean, I love graffiti. I think it should, I think street art and just art in general should be Mm -hmm. everywhere. I think it just brings cities to life and makes the value go up. And, you know, there's a place in Dallas that not a lot of people know about it's called fabrication yard and it's i don't know who owns it but someone has dedicated an entire block Mm. of warehouses to the local graffiti artist in in dallas so there's amazing art over there it turns over it's super super cool so it's kind of the same place in bristol or in london and in more of the european cities i think they have more you know street cred and recognition and they they hold it higher but even in in a town that i would say is vehemently against graffiti which Mm -hmm. would be dallas that they, they do not look you know fondly upon that in any sort of way there's these little pockets where you'll find these amazing these amazing artists that are that are doing super good work and i think it's just it just brings life to the city in general that you see Mm -hmm. and you know as a you know and now i would i would never go in graffiti in a place that it wasn't legal but i think what the cities are finding that if you do do these dedicated walls they get art for free amazing great art and it, it provides an opportunity for the younger kids to, you know, to begin practicing when they're young, not just painting on anything, but that they're able to go to design spaces, see other artists get trained. So I think it's absolutely crucial for cities to add more and more of mm-hmm. that in the streets and in the walls. Yeah, no, that's yeah, I, I agree. And I just think it's it's cool just even that 
in a way you benefited from learning from that as well to apply to like a more traditional art eventually right so i think so and i think people are are beginning to see street art more as art is i mean it's a it's a genre and a thing of its own that's that's just as cool you know it's and it's mm-hmm. it's its own it's its own style of music if you want to compare it to music and so people are realizing that these pieces are going up there they're really amazing and so that it's it's getting more and more value and appreciation which i think is really really cool yeah so one thing you mentioned that this isn't the first time it's been mentioned on this podcast is like so when you were starting out as an engineer sound engineer there were people just willing to help you and there was a good community around it and i just had someone on who said like as a graphic design entrepreneur she's found a really big support group on instagram just to kind of not support group in the sense of like she was downtrodden about design but support like meaning she could ask people, what are you charging and what do you do when you have this problem and i i think that one thing that ends up lacking in a lot of businesses and like in a traditional office setting is people feeling like they can ask questions and ask for help and get it but i've noticed outside of those settings it's normal and So when you transitioned more into like the mural art and just art in general, have you found that you had that kind of community somewhere else and just, and then you moved to Basel, which you moved to a whole different place. So were you able to create that sense somewhere else or is it not part of what you're doing now? Like the sense of community amongst artists? No, absolutely. I'll give a, a, a shout out to one of the guys that's in the room right now, Lex Cornell. And he's one of my best friends and pretty much I bounce all of my art off of him. And, mm-hmm. and he's been incredibly supportive when I've been over here and, you know, a couple of others. But you, you find, you know, you find your guys that, that run with you and that can give you the honest feedback and, you know, can, that take their own art very seriously. And, and they help you on, on all aspects. And just a little simple thing that I think is it's, it's sounds so ridiculous but it's so amazing at the same time is we have this playlist that we that we play that's live and Mm -hmm. so whenever we get in the studio and sometimes a couple other guys get in there with us and we're painting we start this playlist and then we're all listening to the same song at the same Mm. time and we're updating each of us are adding tracks as we feel the vibes and everything and there's something that just know that you're because i would say art can be pretty lonely Mm -hmm. If you're just painting, you know, there's, you know, you're talking to yourself a lot, which is, you know, can be good or bad, right? Pretty bad conversation in my, in, in my, my part, but uh, having, having guys that are working with you and just constantly bouncing things off, it makes a world of world of difference. And also, again, I have to shout out to my, to my wife, especially she's Mm -hmm. been incredibly helpful and just basically the, the whole reason that I am where I'm at and that I'm able to do what I, what I absolutely love, which is painting this because she has so much more of the organizational side of things Mm -hmm. that she can really keep me focused, but also keep me emotionally grounded as I go Mm -hmm. from, you know, being like, nobody loves me. I'm horrible to the next day being like, I am God's gift to mankind. (laughs) You know, she just keeps me like right grounded, right in the middle as best she can. But uh, as far as the community in Basel, there's been several artists here that not necessarily in the same medium, but photographers and a couple of musicians that I've that I've bumped into that have been incredibly helpful that are just like, hey, man, you need to go check out this place. A couple of graffiti artists as well that are just, you know, really open. So I find and I know that in, in some parts of the art world, it can be very, very snobby and not inclusive at all. Mm-hmm. But so far... I guess, you know, in my experience, because, you know, my world's a little bit different, right? I'm going into people's homes and and creating Mm -hmm. something. And it's very, you know, I'm not really in a gallery like other artists have to be. Mm -hmm. So my my interaction is a bit more personal, which has just been amazing. And the support that I find that I get from the the people, my former clients is unbelievable. You know, it's basically passing by name. You know, they pass my name along and they're they're so encouraging in a lot of ways. But. Yeah, I think I was very lucky to have the friends that I had in Dallas that continued to stay strong when I came to Basel, and they continue to back me up all the time, which is just, you know, incredible. And they also give me the hard truth when I'm painting something that looks 
looks pretty bad. You know, they just they <laughs> they lay it out there. You know, I think yeah. I, it, just to put you know Cornell on the spot one more time. I sent him a painting one time, and I was like, "What do you think?" And he's like, "Eczema." And I was like, oh, God, that was like the first thing that came to your head. And it was like a portrait that I was doing for a client. <laughs> I was like, oh, OK, I'm going to restart this. I was like, <laughs> yeah, you gave so, them a skin condition. Like, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So <laughs> you definitely if you order, I don't know, I've never commissioned a portrait of myself, nor, nor am I likely to. But I would think. Like, I wouldn't want you to add to my rosacea. You know, I would think right. I'd want you to <laughs> tone it down you a little bit. You want to tone that back, right? I'm like, why am I just now all red, Stuart? <laughs> right. You need shades of red right there, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. exactly. Oh, did you run out of... <laughs> yeah, I ran know. out of all the other colors, so... <laughs> no, that's great. So, when you go into someone's home, I mean... So, I don't know, I'm going to compare. give this a bad comparison, and I already know it. But, like, for example, when someone gets a tattoo, it's really permanent so like if someone messes that up that's really really bad right i i feel like people would react similarly if you went into their home and messed up their wall like their main wall or something you know and so do you get nervous about i think you just made me a lot nervous when you put it oh, in that pres- <laughs> <laughs> i wasn't nervous before but no. yeah sometimes sometimes i get a little bit nervous i mean m- most of the clients i think it's the, the approach i have with the with the client you know, mm-hmm. so we sit down and we talk about the vision and the vibe that they want. And then I, I, I found that not everyone is as trusting mm-hmm. to your, which, you know, I don't blame them, but I think it really helps f- for them to visualize it. And how, how I do that is I take a picture of their wall and we talk about what they want. We talk about their vision, their design, their vibes that they want. And then I design directly onto that photo. Mm-hmm. Okay. So that they see their wall and then they see what it will be, mm-hmm. the design digitally on their wall. And that takes a lot of fears away. And then, mm-hmm. you know, you say, do I get nervous? Not really, because then once we get into it, it's just, you know, plug and play, right? Because, mm-hmm. you know, I already know what we're going to be doing. And I wouldn't necessarily put anything on the wall that I couldn't do. Gotcha. So I'm pretty, I I make sure that I'm pretty confident before we go and we start doing the work. And, and, you know, sometimes I work in my studio and I'll practice on, on my walls, making sure I get a particular technique correct. But by the end of the day, before I even walk into, you know, to someone's home to, to begin painting, I already know how we need to do it, what layers go down first, where it's going to go, how it's going to work. Mm -hmm. And all of that is pretty much clockwork. So that takes a lot of the the fear away from messing somebody's home. But uh, you you know, you always do have the fear that you're going to kick over a can of paint and spend like nine days trying to get it out of the floor. And yeah, (laughs) that's, that's always there. So, oh gosh, I didn't see now. I didn't even think of that part because that's a good one. Because I'm like, for me, I'm clumsy. Like I, so I'm living in a studio I have knocked over my water bottle so many times <laughs> right. during lockdown. And some days, one day I did it twice and I just was like, okay, you're one, you're one person in one room. I know that's like not a lot of space. Just like, you know, you're always in this one room and all your stuff's in the same room, but come on. Like, do you really <laughs> have to keep knocking this bottle? And I was like, oh, I'm so glad it wasn't wine or I'm so glad it wasn't beer. Just the yeah. beer would be fine, but it would upset me right. more. You know, but right. did oh. you spill the beer? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what, like, a, what, what a waste of beer. Yeah. What a waste. Oh, man. So, yeah, that's true. I didn't think about so clumsy artists. That'd be kind of yeah. a good. It's a, it is. You know, I've gotten I probably spend more more time than I ever would imagine in the setup. Mm-hmm. than then I mean, not then painting, actually, you know, that does take a lot more time. But, you know, when I was young, it was like, oh, we're going to be messy and splash paint everywhere. And now it's like I walk in with like rolls of paper, tape it down. Everything is like covered, you know, plates come off the walls, everything, because it's like mm-hmm. I'm painting in homes that are some of them are hundreds and hundreds of years old, which adds a nice little extra little yeah, bit of nervous to it. And then some of these homes in Switzerland are are pretty nice you know there there are some people in switzerland i know it's crazy that have money (laughs) and so you go into some of these homes and they are huge and they are well crafted everything you know it's not just a cookie cutter home 
So th- that is probably gives me more nerves is <laughs> me literally, you know, kicking over my water bottle than like messing up the wall. You know, that's, yeah. it's pretty easy to paint over, but you know, you, you pour, sure. you know, paint into a floor that's hundreds of years old that can start making you a little bit more nervous. But, yeah. I can see know. that. Yeah. You, so, you get over it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. Right. So one thing that I think would be interesting to know, and I like to ask people is like, so when someone's going to you and they want either a, a piece commissioned or like a, mur- a wall mural or something, what is the best way someone can describe what they want to you? And then what's like the worst way? Like what's the most difficult thing for you to deal with versus like the best way they can go about it? the the worst way is be like i don't know what i really want because <laughs> then it's just you got to start way in the beginning to where like okay what kind of vibe do you want what kind of you know and then they'll be like i want something modern and it's like <laughs> god that's you know that's not even a that's not even even a sort of a remote direction you know it's kind of in a direction so clients that don't know what they want but have a strong opinion about everything. Those mm-hmm. are, are those are the ones you need to run from because it's like, no, I don't like this. I don't like this. I don't like this. I don't like that. I don't like this. I kind of like that. I don't like, and it's just, it's like, if you haven't found something that you like on the internet, you just yeah. don't like anything because there is everything on the internet. So for you yeah. to not be able to send me a picture of something that you remotely like might just mean it's you, you know, at the <laughs> end of the day, but those are those are typically the worst clients or the ones yeah. that just are are unsure and then they're also scared that they are going to to make a decision that they're not going to like and yeah. then they will be you know held responsible cuz i you know if we're going in especially if it's there there's two different there's two different clients sorry i'm going to get real in the weeds no, there's the I ones want, yeah. that there's the ones that want you know my art to where they're like you paint me something i want it to be yours you know mm-hmm. and so that's it's no opinion from them you know i might talk to them and be like what kind of color or you know is there a particular you know person that you would like and i'll paint it mm-hmm. in my particular style those are, are super easy i love that the 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 other clients are the ones that to where I would consider myself more of a service than a particular art, right? So mm-hmm. I'm going to create something for you. I'm kind of more of a designer at mm-hmm. that point. And those are the pe- the ones that you that are a little bit of the scarier ones are the ones that are afraid they're going to say something and then they aren't going to like it and then mm-hmm. they get caught, you know, because they're the ones that say it. So you have to kind of reassure them along the way that you know this. This is going to look good, you know, and talk to them. And those are the ones that you need to present, you know, visit, visual, visualizations, visualizations, visualizations. Yeah, visualizations. Thank you. <laughs> of, of the artwork before you get it. The, the really cool ones, they're the ones that, you know, are A, either I want a piece of your art or two, you know, I like this right here. Here's an image you know, mm-hmm. rock and roll with it. I want it to be that. And those are the fun ones. The, the, I guess the good ones are the ones who send you something and they say, I want exactly this on this wall with these colors. And that takes, that's just doing the job, right? That takes all right. kind of the art, the art, the artistry out of it. And then you're, a, you know, you're a painter and I like painting. So that works as well. So mm-hmm. that's kind of the spectrum of the, of the clients that you get. Yeah. So then the question is, or I could make an assumption that you prefer the one who's just looking for something created by Stuart and you just kind of, you deliver that and you have all the creative reign. Is that probably your favorite one or that, that is, that is a favorite one, but that also does add extra pressure because mm-hmm. you, then you go to this deep, you know, psychological, are they going to like my art? Do they not love me? Oh my God, is the painting not good enough? You know, yeah. are they going to hate it? You know, place when otherwise when they're like, Hey, can you paint this? You're like, ah, yeah, I can paint that. And they're like, I love it. And it's like, Oh, well, if you didn't love it, you know, you want to send me this. So that, that part. So the emotional <laughs> part of that is a little heavier, but yeah, yeah, it is, it is nice when someone like comes and they're like, Hey, I li- like your abstract or I like your portraits and I want something like this. Then that's, that's really cool. But I think probably the the thing that I get the most pleasure out of, because as I get older, maybe I have a little less ego. Don't ever tell my wife that. But, <laughs> you know, I, I, I think what makes me more happy, I don't necessarily need them to love my art. I just want them to love what they get. 
that mm-hmm. that really that makes me more happy as I do my my day job, as I would call it. So mm-hmm. if you want some of my art, that's fantastic. If you want me to paint something that you have, that's that's great too. As long as you love it and I capture the vibe. And so a, a really cool recent project I did, we I did a geometric uh, wall, and mm-hmm. we based it off of a mural a mirror that that the lady had. And she didn't know what she wanted when we got in there. She was like, I just want something with color. And so we were like, oh, let's do, let's do geometric of something. So we came up with the geometric. And then I saw the mirror, and I was like, that mirror is fascinating to me. And she told me the story about how her husband loved it, and, and he had passed since. Mm. And I was like, let's design this whole mural off of this mirror because it's an iconic piece on its own. And so we took the whole uh, design basically off the mirror and then came in and painted it and she loved it and i just loved working on it and so that's not something that i would have normally painted if i was going to sit down on some of my art but i'm really proud of that piece and i got Mm. an immense amount of you know joy out of it and and pleasure by painting that and so i think that's where i really hit my stride because that's where my my skill lies you know coming from the scenic background and working with different directors and creating something is sometimes you know my skill is i can find what you want and then i can help you get there yeah so if that makes sense yeah it does it does and i think that's great and i guess one question that i thought of was just thinking about you and your career and so you got your degree in performance yes now you're you know and then you went through and we're pragmatic about okay well i really need to do some other more tech stuff to just at least get by in Dallas. And now you're doing the painting. Did you ever at any point in all that either regret that you didn't go into some other line of work or feel like you should just because, you know, you got beat up by the whole artist life or do you, did you always just want it and you just kept pursuing it somehow? Cause your track hat to now hasn't been totally linear anyway, but Right. Just kind of wondering how what your feeling was around all of it and like where you are now. You know, I I always loved what I was doing. I just wanted to get paid more. Mm-hmm. That's what, that's what I would always tell my <laughs> wife. You know, she was like, "You want to go do something else?" It's like, not really. I just want to get paid more for doing what mm-hmm. I do. And I would say what I do has always been kind of project based. So it was you know working on this film, working on this show, doing this little bit of music here, you know, doing this art project over here and so i think i it took me a long time to take myself as a professional which Mm. may have kept me from being as as linear as i should have been so i I would do the projects but i wouldn't do them as professionally as i should you know i didn't see myself Mm. as a professional and i think you know getting over that hurdle was huge and so you know to answer your question I, i i love my life I have had an amazing experience in everything I've done. There's been some some horrible times. <laughs> There's been some great times. There's been times where I've literally, my car ran out of gas, and I coasted into a parking lot, shut the door, and then just walked to the theater and, and lived there for two weeks before I got paid. I don't think they ever do that. <laughs> but, you know, but I've loved every minute of it. And so, mm-hmm. you know, to me... I don't think you pick the theater. I think it picks you. And so I think I was picked at a very young age. And I think it's the same with arts, with art in itself. I was, I remember paintings that my grandmother had painted. And I remember always being in the art. So it was always there. And, Mm -hmm. you know, I just kind of had to find it. And, uh, you know, knowing me, I would never stop and ask for directions. So that would take much longer for me to get there. But... No, I don't think I would. I I couldn't do any other career. You know, Mm. I just couldn't. And so, you know, I worked nine to five jobs and I was horrible at them. You know, I literally only worked them to to go to lunch. You know, that was the the only reason I would do it. And now, you know, I'm working, you know, a job to where I get lost in it to where I don't even think about it. You know, it's not even close to being work. And to where I'm just, you know, it's, it, it hits all my strengths. And so it took me a bit to get there around, but it was always, you know, it was just me kind of feeling my way there. And so I, you know, I, when I was in a different place, it, most of the time I knew I was in the wrong place, but it was, it was, I was just on my way, you mm-hmm. know, but I still knew I was in the particular journey heading in the right direction. And I learned, 
I learned so much from so many different people that have helped me along the way just you know how to invoice you know you you don't yeah. learn that in art school you don't learn the taxes i wouldn't have never learned that you don't learn the business side from the, from you know the the art school and so going into these businesses and working all these different jobs and freelancing and all of this stuff i think I, it was something that i had to do so i look back of it i don't think i would change it because i don't think i could do what i do now if i hadn't have done that if that yeah. makes sense yeah it does no oh, that's great so one other thing I want to talk to you about is you have a podcast. So we're going to get very meta and you can talk about your podcast. On my okay. Podcast. <laughs> but, a, a podcast on a podcast. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So uh, you have the Happy Expats podcast. Yes. So, and it's fun. I mean, you guys, this isn't as much. I'm not drinking yet this evening while I'm doing this. So, and you guys kind of the opposite on yours. You guys will have a really good time. So what's your podcast? What's, what's going on there? Well, when I, when we first moved to, you know, being an expat, you move to, you know, a new country and you tend to meet up with expats first. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think it's kind of like that idea of when you all first go to college, if, you know, you go to college in the U.S., everybody's from somewhere. So you yeah. all decide to be, you know, friends again. Yeah. And so um, moving to Basel, you know, I kind of uh, connected with the with these a bit all expats and so a couple of us guys got together and we we're all just hanging out and talking and really just you know enjoying being with each other and we had a good basically good vibes and rapport that we were like hey you know what we should do because one night we were sitting around talking about how difficult it is to you know to integrate into the swiss culture and we we're all telling all you know our horror stories and our mm-hmm. really funny stories about about it. You know, I had this idea. I was like, man, we should do an expat podcast because that way we can hang around with each other and, you know, our wives would be totally cool with it and it wouldn't just be us hanging around with each other all the time anyway. Now it's actual, <laughs> you know, a product by the end of it. And so the guys were like, oh, yeah, let's, you know, let's try it. So I think at the very beginning it was let's just hang out and, you know, have a couple of drinks and, you know, chat and talk about, you know, whatever funny story we happen to have. And then it kind of grew into something to where we started having different expats on from different cultures. And our our, kind of our one rule is you have to be, you know, an expat and then you have to be living in Switzerland. Mm -hmm. And so we made ourselves extremely niche, you know, because we're only about being expats in Switzerland, which I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but I guess it really doesn't matter. So (laughs) we started having these guys having guests on and then we began realizing that we were like learning so much and people were actually getting in, you know, kind of involved in the show and we're getting great feedback. And so every every show we have a guest on from a different country and some people have been here for, you know, 40 years in Switzerland and basically are now more Swiss than they are wherever they came from. Mm -hmm. And then we have some that are fresh off the boat. Only been in Switzerland, you know, discovering all these fabulous rules that Switzerland has that are just hilarious. It's it's quite, uh, you know, you, you can't vacuum on Sundays in Switzerland. I don't know if you know that. Really? Yeah, and you also should not flush your toilet past midnight. It's considered rude. <laughs> Another thing. <laughs> so, like, all this stuff that you never, ever, ever, ever would think about. Because, yeah. Because Switzerland is so respectful of noise. Mm. So they're like, hey, uh, there's a certain time in the day where everyone needs just to be quiet. And so there's an hour that you can't like drill or nail or be loud. And then you can't recycle on on Sundays because the bottles would be too loud throwing them away, which is hilarious because the bells are ringing like crazy. Right. You can hear from 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 miles away. And they're like, no, you can't throw those bottles away because they're too loud. So this whole the whole podcast basically started growing off of that because it was like, hey, I got this crazy story about when I first got here. And then we started interviewing more and more. And so the the happy expats and I'm on it with the three other guys, Basti, who is from from Germany. And so he's a, a proper Byron boy from from up there where which you know byron is kind of like the texas of uh germany i've now <laughs> discovered and then javi who's from from spain and then also uh, james is who's from england so it's basically we sound like a bad joke you know a german guy yeah. a spanish guy an english guy and an american walk into a you know to a bar and so those <laughs> those four guys are, are riding shotgun with me and it's pretty awesome nice that's that is awesome though i really like that so I have a set of questions 
that I ask every guest. But before I get to that, do you have any advice or mantra that you just would like to share with the audience? Oh, man. When it comes to art or just comes to life? or Sure, any of it. Whatever you want. Like something that maybe, maybe if if it's about art, maybe when you do get those kind of ego trips where you're, because, well, and just for the... Just for the more than work people to to know, the people who are listening to the podcast, Stuart and I are actually on Clubhouse right now too, and we're broadcasting this to a room, and we're going to do a Q and Q and A after. But I know at least one person in the room is a comedian. I'm a comedian. I what you said resonated with me about just those times when you feel like, "Am I good enough? Does anyone like me?" Because that happens in in our art too. Yeah, absolutely. you know, you're delivering in a different way, and so maybe like, yeah, advice on that or a mantra you use, or just on life. It doesn't matter, but. That particularly resonated for sure. I think the the most in, important thing that I learned when it come, came comes to art or into life, really. I don't know if this applies to anything. I mean, maybe it's something you can stick on a bumper sticker. <laughs> um, but I think art and comedy in these performance based careers are very intimidating because if you go to a, a typical job. You start off as an entry level and you realize that I'm going to work here for three years. And then if I do this, I'm going to go there for five years. And then you can map your way to being the CEO or, you know, wherever you want to be. It's a clear Mm -hmm. path. It's a clear road. And when you're doing the art, it's, it's not, there's nobody that's, that's maybe there's somebody that's kind of doing what you're sort of doing, but not really. And if Mm -hmm. you copy them, then it, you will not succeed. Right. And I think, so you're constantly groundbreaking yourself. You know, you're, you're finding your own way through the jungle. And that's the coolest part because, you know, it's, it's you, it's the process as you move forward. So for a, for a long time, I did not like many things about me. And mm. I was like, ah, oh, I wish, you know, I was more like this. And I'm sure every single person like looks at themselves and is like, oh, I'm trying to deliver this joke like this guy, or I'm trying to paint like this guy, or I'm trying to write like this guy and that's probably the worst thing you can do you can take the lessons that they give and you can look and you can learn from them but the only real thing that you have is you right that's the only new that's the only thing that makes you particularly special and as soon as you realize that the more you can begin developing yourself and finding your own niche and so, mm-hmm. you know, if I look in my past life, I was always like, you know, what am I doing? I'm painting sets, but I know I don't necessarily want to do theater. And there was a million reasons for me to quit doing a million things. But I, you know, I never would have thought that if I continued to, to work these skills and develop, then I find myself in another country and I find myself in a niche. And then I suddenly am, you know, am, you know, a successful artist. Yeah. Um, so I think that you have to really look at at your flaws because those are probably at the end of the day going to be your best your your best friends because that's mm-hmm. going to give you that extra little flavor that gives you you know the taste that makes you you know special so i i think i try to if i was going to wrap all that up because i'm long-winded <laughs> you know, i gotta blame it on my dad he's a preacher <laughs> You know, it's it's the and it sounds you know it's super cheesy, but everybody says it's like kind of love yourself, but it's it's true. Like you, it, not that everything about you is good, but everything about you is you, and so you just find those things, and you and you it'll it'll make you special if you find those things, you know. And so those special little things about you, and so that's kind of what I what I do. And the second thing that I always tell the only bit of advice to anybody is learn another language. Because it opens up an entire new world for you that you mm-hmm. would have never had. New art, new music, new philosophies, new religions, yeah. new everything. And so if you can learn another language, it will double your chances in getting a job. And that's yeah. super important. So, <laughs> Yeah, well, if you misunderstand someone telling you to paint something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that, oh. And that actually is true. I was actually uh, at a consultation today, and I was trying to talk German. And Lord sweet baby jesus we had to go down to some like basic hand signals because they were like because they didn't speak english and so i was talking in in my broken german and i was like yeah lena is a lena line is that the line is this the line and so it was like <laughs> quick some google translate because we're in some serious trouble of what i just agreed to <laughs> so yeah oh, that's, absolutely that's awesome all right 
So we have the the last five questions. Well, it's going to be six. I'm really bad with you know doing that. Like, uh, okay. oh, I have two things to say. Well, here's four. But okay. anyway. well, well, I have to, I have a bad thing of trying to keep things concise, so it'll probably yeah. take another six All years. Right. All right. So I have five questions, then another follow up. So, what is the oldest T-shirt you have and still wear? Oh, oh, see that ah man, that's tough because I did leave a lot of clothes. I don't know what's in the U.S., but the one that I brought over here is an FC Dallas t-shirt from like god 2006 maybe Mm -hmm. i think 2007 when i was like i got kicked out of actually a lot of people don't know this but i got kicked out of out of the out of the stadium in fc dallas because i got in a huge fight with the front office anyway they were jerks but yeah i was a i was a season ticket holder and a supporter I still am, but I don't think they'll let me back in the stadium anymore. <laughs> so your face is on a poster. Yeah, right? maybe somewhere in a database. <laughs> oh my gosh! All right. So, <laughs> so if every day was really Groundhog's Day, like people have been saying, because of all the lockdowns and everything, right? It seems really much the same all the time. What song would you have a, your alarm clock set to play every single morning? man in the morning time? Mm-hmm. Well, uh, that's when you wake up. If you wake up at night, that's fine. <laughs> you're right. It would be s- some jazz. It would probably be Kind of Blue by, mm-hmm. you know, Chet, yeah, either Miles Davis or Chet Baker. One of oh, those. Okay. So, Or, uh, you know, Almost Blue. Kind oh, blue. okay. Almost yeah, Blue yeah, by yeah. Chet Baker or Kind of Blue by Miles Davis, yeah. Okay. I was like, oh, man, did I really mess up my... No, 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 I that. did. That was what that was okay. my... I was, oh, being a, I was being a Chet Faker there. there somebody <laughs> can go look up that reference. Yeah. Well, it's like, I didn't claim to be a jazz aficionado, so fine. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Um, okay, coffee or tea or neither? Coffee. coffee. Way too all much right. coffee all day but long. Any kind of way or just like black or? Actually, so I have a side, a really cool cool story about me drinking coffee. Can I can I walk into yeah. that, that world? So I used to not drink coffee, and if I did, I drank these sugary Starbucks. Mm, you know, they're they're yeah. not coffee, right? You know, they're just a milkshake. And I was working with this Russian dude named Pavel. So shout out to Pavel. He was like my production father. I'm gonna do a really bad Russian accent, but he was like, he was like, let me tell you how the old country. So he, <laughs> we were working on this a ballet. And I ordered this Starbucks drink that was super, you know, sweet. And he was like, you know, if you work with me for the next, because I was working for him for the next two weeks, he was like, I'll buy your coffee every day, but you have to drink it like I drink it. And I was super poor then. And I was like, fine, whatever. And so he drank it black or he drank it just plain with a little bit of milk, a little bit of skim milk. Mm-hmm. And it was an adjustment. But by the end of it, I was like, this is magical. So. I got to give nice. a shout out to Papa. That's what I always called him. So. <laughs> nice. That's good. Yeah, because that's more like the, the kids order, like the Frappuccinos. Oh, yeah, stuff. absolutely. Yeah. It's like nothing but like a heart attack there. And he was like, you know, this is how yeah. you need to drink your coffee. So <laughs> cool. Do you can you think of a time that you laughed so hard you cried or couldn't stop laughing or something that makes you do that? Like, you know, <laughs> I always think these stories are funny. So, yeah, absolutely. So <laughs> this is another shout out to Cornell. Because he's here on the on the clubhouse, but we actually—I don't know if you know this—but I was an aspiring rapper back in the day. No. Yeah, well, we're super aspiring. It's so <laughs> every time one of my my favorite things is every time I go back to Dallas, I have two two good friends, Rodrigo and Alex Cornell, and we always get together and we basically rap battle each other. Mm. And we sit around and we started it with our podcast gear because we would play, you know, things. And so the last time I went back, we recorded ourselves rap battling and just rap, just the, just an hour and a half of the worst off the top rapping you have ever heard in your life. <laughs> and I remember I had not laughed that hard since I think I was, you know, maybe a kid. The next day, my chest hurt. I was laughing so hard. <laughs> and so that was that that's definitely I have the recording somewhere and we're going to listen to it again but whenever I go back we do a we do a rap night which is you, you can't be cool when you're like you know pushing 40 rapping you know so it's it's yeah. it's for the oh, yeah. love it's I for know. the love of the art man it's for the love of the art <laughs> Great, and we'll see in the Q&A, which will be a bonus episode sometime, or maybe right after this, I'm not sure yet, if we can get 
Alex to do that. Okay, um, he's getting the freestyle. <laughs> <laughs> okay, cool. And then the last one, who inspires you right now? Who inspires me? Many people. Many people. I, I think the one of the, of course, you know, my wife, Alex, mm-hmm. my good bud, Rodrigo, you know, your, your average, what a friend of mine used to call your dusties. You know, the guys that are always there when the dust settles after the fight, mm. you know, those kind of guys. One, one guy that I've recently found that I just find fascinating because um, on YouTube, actually, is a guy named Bo Miles. He's this professor in Australia. And he, he's an adventurer, kind of, you know, philosophical sort of dude. And he just does these videos. And he's, I think I relate to him a lot because we're kind of in the same situation. We both have small kids. You know, he's fascin- you know, he's a fascinating dude. Not that I'm fascinating, but, you know, we're in kind of the same point of life. Mm-hmm. And he does these videos. And, you know, he did like a video like I'm walking to work. And so he walked 90 kilometers and that was his commute that he drove every day. But it took him a Whoa. day and a half to get there. And he went there with no food or water. And he had to live off the street. And just his insights on things. Hmm. I find him incredibly fascinating because he really makes me stop and think. Because he does just simple things. But he really focuses. Like he, he did this. He was like, I'm going to go on a one-mile walk with my daughter. And it took him like hours and hours and i relate to that because you know i take my daughters to you know to school and we have to walk here and when they're super young it took 45 minutes (laughs) to do a 10 minute walk and you know at first you're just so annoyed and Mm -hmm. then you you're like you know what i have not stopped and looked at a bug in a long time so i'm gonna stop Mm -hmm. appreciate this look at a bug and so I find him incredibly insightful on a lot of things because he, he you know, he's, he's a really unassuming guy. And so he's, he's been a bit of a, just kind of an inspiration in a, in a sort of way. That's the newest one. But, you know, other than that, of course, it's, it's my, my good friends and, and my wife, of course. Well, that's, yeah, that's, that's cool. I'll have to check that guy out. All right. So is there anything you want to promote or like any where people should go to find you? And I'll have the show notes, but just for you to tell them if they want to see your art. No yeah, absolutely. You. I mean, you can check me out at Stuart Stevens Art on Instagram and all the social media platforms, Facebook. I got a TikTok now because oh, I'm, yeah. I'm young and hip with the kids. Uh, <laughs> so TikTok and then a website, StuartStevensArt.com. And yeah, hit me up if you want me to come and paint a mural. I will, you know, have gun, will travel. Awesome. But not because you're in Basel. You can't have a gun in travel. Yes. Actually, you can't have guns here. <laughs> you can? Weirdly enough. Yeah. The, oh, so the, it's like the Texas of Europe. It, it is. Without all the Texans. It, it's strange. That's so funny. I didn't know that. Because yeah. here they make a big deal about that. Like, that's like the thing they hold over Americans. Yeah. It's one of them. One of the things. But so yeah. So everybody has a gun in Switzerland. They just don't have bullets. Yeah. So, but it is, it is, it's so weird. But, you know, you're talking about Switzerland. Dallas has more people than Switzerland has as a country, like the metro. Uh, that's true. Yeah, it's a crazy. Yeah. You know, so and these dudes are just like sitting up in the mountains, hanging out with their cows. It's a it's yeah. a it's a it's a beautifully weird place. Switzerland is pretty fabulous. So, yeah, they, I, I found that out the other day because I was stopped on the side of the road at a gas station and I just heard a bunch of gunshots. And Whoa. I was like, man, it is going down. The Germans are invading again, you know? And, uh, and they're like, no, there's a shooting range right over there. So, oh, wow. Yeah, and so they all have their guns. So I started looking at it, and everybody was like, yeah, everybody has guns here. It's kind of weird. Oh. The other th- weird thing is if you build a building here, you have to build a bomb shelter. And that was put into law because of the Germans, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, still. That's crazy. Cool. Well, see – learning up until the end dude it's 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 a fascinating place here you know <laughs> cool all right well Stuart, thank you so much so hey thank really you appreciate being on thank you so much it was a pleasure to be here keep up the good work and yeah i mean it was i can't thank you enough for for inviting me on yeah well i'm really excited so thanks Thanks again for listening this week. You can find out more about the guest in the show notes and at RobbieHasSaid.com. Joe Mafia created the music just for this podcast. Find him on Spotify. That's Joe, M-A-F-F-I-A. And Rob Metke is responsible for our visual design. You can find him online by searching for Rob, M-E-T-K-E. Thanks, Rob.
Let me know who you'd like to hear from or about your own experiences defining yourself outside of work. Follow at More Than Work Pod or send a message on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, or LinkedIn. Or visit our website, morethanworkpod.com. Give us a follow on Spotify, Apple, or wherever you get your podcasts and leave a review if you like. Thanks for listening to More Than Work. While being kind to others, don't forget to be kind to yourself. Thank you.